So learning unit seven is going to be a fairly short learning unit. We're only going to have two skills and two lecture periods that we'll take for this uh, learning unit, but it's on quantum theory and atomic structure. So we think about things like the electromagnetic spectrum. We're going to talk about um, where electrons are in atoms. And so that will then lead us into our next learning unit as well with a little bit more of a deep dive as to where those electrons are um, and how that leads to sort of the properties that we see for uh, different elements. So two skills, again, for this learning unit on quantum theory and atomic structure. And the first one is on light and atomic spectra. So we sort of take a little bit of a physics approach first uh, again here, just like we did in our last learning unit when we talked a little bit about work and energy and so forth. Now we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, electromagnetic radiation. And so electric uh, electromagnetic radiation is um, energy that travels all at the same velocity. It travels at the speed of light here. So this is going to be an important constant that we're going to use for some of our calculations here. But not all light is the same, right? We can think about um, uh, visible light, right? Typically when people think about light, they think about visible light, but we also have uh, ultraviolet and then infrared light that kind of bracket that um, visible spectrum, which is actually a very small part of the entire electromagnetic uh, spectrum. Uh, but then we also have radio waves that are down here, um, x-rays that are up here. And, you know, typically you can even just rationalize and think about, well, X-rays, those I, I know are sort of damaging, um, but I don't think of radio waves as being damaging. And a lot of that has to do with the properties of light that we describe using three variables, uh, two constants, and two equations, which we can kind of morph together to make kind of a, a third equation. All equations, again, that are provided for you. So when we think about the properties of light, we can describe them using three variables, and I'm going to highlight what they are here. So these three variables are going to be wavelength, which we have here. They're going to be frequency, which we have here. And then we've got um, energy, and that's not explicitly listed as um, a property, uh, but that it, those are the different properties of light, and those properties are related by these equations. I should say that frequency is also listed in this equation. So three variables, frequency, wavelength, and energy, and those properties are related by these equations that we have here. Two constants that we'll talk about. So the first is the speed of light that we talked about in our last slide there, and then Planck's constant. Uh, which is uh, abbreviated with H. Uh, again, it's a constant that will be provided for you. It's just a constant that is part of this equation here. So just like we've talked about before, we've talked about direct and sort of inverse relationships between properties. So I want to talk about these three properties of light very briefly. Talk about kind of a fourth property that is not anything that we'll spend a lot of time talking about. It's not part of these equations. But again, energy, wavelength, and frequency. So I'm going to show you too that one equation that's not written on here, which is sort of an important piece since there is sort of this common piece of um, frequency that's within both of these. We can also say that E is equal to HC over lambda. So that's kind of putting these two equations together. All of these equations will be provided for you so you don't need to remember them. You just need to know how and when you'd like to use them. So I'm going to talk about each of these properties briefly in turn, right? Some qualitative questions you might have a quiz uh, on this. But when we think about wavelength, we think about the width of a wave. So electromagnetic radiation really has um, a wave property to it. So when we think about the wavelength, that's the distance between two crusts, or you could think about it as two troughs, but basically it's the width of the wave. Okay, how wide it is. And if we come back here for a second, we can see things like, like radio waves are really long, have very long wavelengths. Okay, And we think about um, things like uh, x-rays, we can think about them as having very short wavelengths. As we're going to talk about it in a second, this is related to what we think about with frequency and also then with energy. All right, so wavelength is the, is the width of a wave, how big it is. If we were to measure it, it's how big that wave is. 
frequency is thought of as the number of waves that are going to pass a point per second. Remember that all of these waves are moving at the same speed. So if you have a wave that's really long and moving at the speed of light, we're not going to have as many pass by, say, our eye if we're watching them in a given period of time compared to wavelengths that are really small. So that, uh, again, is our frequency. So it's the number of waves that are going to pass a point per second. And it's intuitive, I think, that it's going to be inversely proportional to wavelength. I just gave you an example. We've got these big, lumbering, meter-long waves of our radio frequency. And if we imagine those traveling at the same speed of light, we're not going to see as many go by us as if we have these tiny little um, you know, uh, x-rays that we have here. These x-rays and these gamma rays, there's so many of them because are packed in a, in, a, in a defined space because their wavelength is so small, the frequency is going to be high. So again, we can see that all kind of coming together with this equation. <clears throat> the speed of light is equal to wavelength times frequency. These are inversely proportional. So if we want to have more waves pass per second, we want our frequency to increase. That means our wavelength has to decrease. Okay. So this is an important equation that shows that relationship between wavelength and frequency. This other equation is important and it relates energy and frequency. And as we can see with these guys, these are directly proportional. If we want to increase the energy of our um, electromagnetic radiation, we want to increase the frequency. And this is sort of intuitive with what we talked about before. You guys don't think about radio waves as being high energy and something that could be dangerous, right? But we do know that about x-rays and things like gamma rays, right? And the reason is because X-rays and gamma rays are very high frequency, low or small wavelength, okay? So understanding the relationship between these um, in both that qualitative sense, which we've been kind of talking about right now, as well as a quantitative sense using these equations, and we'll get to that in just a minute, is going to become very important. The last piece of information is not necessarily a property that we're going to do any calculations with, but it has to do with the amplitude. So for example, if I'm looking at this wavelength right now, right, I'm tracing it here, it has a certain amplitude, which is the height of the wave. I can have the same wavelength and the same frequency, but just drawing those waves taller, that's going to have a higher amplitude. This has to do with the intensity of the radiation. So brightness for visible light. It's not really above uh, part of the above equations because it can get a little bit confusing. We're not going to do a lot with it, but I do want you to understand that um, it, it more has to do with the amount that you have uh, than the energy per se. Because you might, you might look at this and say, oh, there's more energy with this. No, there's not really more energy. There's just more of it. And I know that's a little bit confusing, so don't worry, we're not going to really do too much with amplitude. But because it is something that uh, is related to the electromagnetic spectrum, I did want to talk about it briefly. All right, quanta. Okay, so this is just a term I want to introduce. Um, it has to do with packets of light or packets of energy. So just some kind of conceptual things to think about here. Did you ever notice how when things are hot they emit light, right? You've got a campfire, and if there's no more flame that's left that's emitting light, you look at those coals, and those coals are glowing, right? Um, and as they get hotter, <coughs> excuse me, they're going to glow brighter and whiter. That's because they are emitting fixed energies uh, as, as, as packets of energies, as quanta, um, and they're emitting them as light, so that energy is being released as light. And really important things happen when you match these energy levels with wavelengths of light. So if you've ever heard of the term photosynthesis, right, that's how plants harness the sun's energy and use it to make carbohydrates. Well, they're matching that wavelength of energy with the chlorophyll that's in their chloroplasts, all really amazing biochemistry, but they're, they're harvesting that energy. Oh, we're going to learn in a little bit um, about neon signs. So when we're actually having um, these different lights that are emitted, we're going to learn about how that happens. Uh, and then spectroscopy, the whole field of spectroscopy relies on using and matching wavelengths of light. Okay, so what's this thing with atomic spectra, right? So if we've got, and this has to do with how neon lights work, if we've got a specific gas that is in a closed tube and we excite those atoms, okay, what's going to happen is they are going to emit 
energy that's of a fixed wavelength. Okay, so if we're having a, a gas that's discharged from this tube, we can use, and this is just a little bit of kind of spectroscopy terminology, we can use a little slit here that's going to focus and just have one sort of um, beam of light that comes through. And you've probably seen a prism before, right? A prism is something that if you shine white light through it, it splits it into the color of the rainbow. So a prism is just going to allow us to split light. And what you see if you split white light is you just see the entire visible spectrum. You see all the colors of the rainbow. What's interesting is if we have a specific atom that we excite, and in this case, it's going to be a hydrogen atom that we excite, and we capture the light that's being emitted there, and we put that through a prism, we don't get all of those wavelengths of light. We get defined ones. We get specific red, green, blue, and purple light, very discrete, and it creates what we call a line spectrum. We only see one specific wavelength of light. And then there's lots of regions in between that are dark, they're black. So this gap in energy has to do with kind of electrons jumping back and forth. And I know this can get a little bit complicated, but just bear with me for a second. If we think about what the Bohr model of the atom is, and we know that electrons kind of reside in these orbitals that are around electrons, or around the center of the nucleus of an atom, what happens is that electrons kind of reside in these very specific levels and they can jump to the next level up, but it's a very defined energy level to jump there. We're going to talk about these as being steps and what it costs to do these jumps. But again, this is a specific gap, so it's a specific energy, so it's a specific wavelength of light. Remember this equation that allows us to relate energy and frequency. Okay, so we're going to have a specific jump that we can have. And so when we've got these excited electrons that have jumped up a level, when they get to jump back down, this is going to be a certain energy of light, a certain frequency of light, a certain wavelength of light. So when we think about certain wavelengths of light, we can think about certain colors like red, like green, like blue and like purple. And you guys will actually have a chance in lab to explore and investigate this. You'll use these prisms, which will split kind of this uh, the light that's discharged from different sources, and you'll see what different colors you see. So hopefully I haven't lost you yet. This actually is going to play into some types of calculations that we'll do. Okay, so when we think about these different wavelengths of light, and here's a little bit of a different picture that shows these colors a little bit more vibrantly. For the hydrogen atom, this, and don't be worried, it looks like a scary equation, but I'm going to show you how to use it. This equation allows us to define the energy that we have that's going to be necessary for electrons to jump between these different levels. So for example, between energies levels 1 and 2, 1 and 3, 3 and 2 three and one, jump around between all these levels, but I want you to imagine and envision this being like a staircase, okay? Now it's not your typical staircase, because look at this staircase. The energy level to get up to this level is much greater than going from here to here, and that energy jump keeps getting smaller and smaller. So I want you to envision sort of an uneven staircase. The first jump is really big, and then each jump that you go up gets a little bit smaller. Okay, so we're going to use this equation to define the energy that it takes to jump around on these different energy levels, to jump between these different stairs. Okay, so using this equation is fairly simple. We define the stairs by integer values. So stair number one, two, three, four, five, six, and so forth. So when we want to figure out how much energy does it take to jump up from, say, step, uh, step number one to step number three, we would put those in here. And remember, it's always final minus initial. So in this case, our final step would be the number three. So we'd put n in for three there, or three in for n there. For n equals one, that's where we're starting initially. We're starting at number one. So all you're going to do is put in one over three squared minus one over one squared. So it's really just one ninth minus one. And then we're going to use this constant here a very small number, but just like Avogadro's number is a very big number, here we've got a very small number. We're going to put this number in here, and this is going to give us the energy in joules that it takes for one electron to do this jump. OK, 
Okay, I'm going to kind of go through and repeat that again because it's really important to understand how to use this equation. The only thing that you're going to be doing is putting whole number values in here to determine the energy that it's going to take to either jump up or jump down. And like you might imagine, you're going to get energy levels that are positive, that are going to be energy to put in if you've got to jump up. You'll get negative values if you're jumping down because you get that energy back, right? You're going downhill, okay? So that's all you need to do to use this equation. It's going to tell us the energy level to jump between these gaps. Now bear with me for a second. I'm going to come back here for a second just to show you we can put that energy level in here and because H and C are both constants, we can figure out the wavelength of light, the color of light that that will be using this equation. So these two pieces kind of come together with this first skill, sort of this physics stuff and these equations and relating energy to wavelength. We can figure out the color of light that we're going to need to do this. So there's going to be some problems that will ask us to think about putting these two pieces together, but that's how we'll do problems like that. So what are some of the kind of questions that you might see kind of with this, um, this kind of skill? Well, maybe you might see some basic uses of these two equations. I might say, hey, you're getting an x-ray at the dentist's office. What wavelength of light is that? You're going to use an equation like one of these three equations, and you'll put in the pieces of information that you know, that you know, and you'll solve for one unknown. So much of what we're doing lately just involves algebra and solving equations for single unknowns. Okay. Um, again, you might have something where you're using this equation and telling me about energy levels that it takes to jump between stairs. At the end of the day, some of these might be simply qualitative. If you remember that the first, uh, that these jumps get smaller and smaller, you could sort of rationalize and understand um, that it's going to be a bigger energy jump to go between one and two than it is between two and three. And obviously, if you're going from one and three to one and five, that one and five step is greater. If it's greater energy, right, we come back to this equation, we can see that energy and frequency are directly related, but energy and wavelength are inversely related. So if I want a high energy, big jump, I need to have a small wavelength, high frequency. Okay, so you might see some qualitative questions like that, or you might see ones where you need to actually do some calculations. This is just another picture that takes... Um, this little bit of a simpler picture and kind of uh, expands it here. So if we're talking about all of these different energy levels, so here's again the center of our atom. We've got all of these different energy levels, all of these different steps that are out here. Notice here this is really representing energy. This is showing like how big our stairs are. So look at the jump between stair one and stair two. Stair two and stair three are smaller. There's four, five, six, and they get smaller and smaller and smaller. But again, noticing what's happening here. If we want to jump down, let's say from a stair, uh, this is stair six, all the way down to the bottom, that's going to be getting rid of ultraviolet light, really high energy light, right? But if we're going down some of these smaller jumps, right? Here, let's go from four to three. That's not very high energy. That's infrared. That's actually below our visible spectrum. That's actually lower in energy. So you can actually look at this picture here and sort of rationalize all the different kind of trends. Here's the visible series, right? Going between six, five, four, three, uh, um, all the way down to energy level two. That's where we'll get our visible series, right? Bigger jumps, there's gonna be higher energy, lower frequency, okay? Um, I'm sorry, higher energy, higher frequency, lower, or higher energy, higher frequency, smaller wavelength. And then here's kind of our lowest energy series. So I do want you to know a little bit about where these things fall. If we think about stuff that we're going to see here, we've got infrared. Now, we don't see infrared, but that's the lowest energy, longest wavelength. Okay. Then we have our visible spectrum. And then we've got our uh, ultraviolet. So ultraviolet is higher energy, higher frequency, smaller wavelength. Okay, so that's all of that stuff kind of in this first skill for our Unit 7 on Quantum Theory and Atomic Structure.